the idea of the monkeys actually is kind of interesting because a few years ago, my wife, my wife is Barbara Sofer, she writes in the Jerusalem Post, which is a column every Friday, and uh, she was giving <coughs> a bunch of lectures in London, and she had the afternoon off. You may have seen this last year, I don't know, because <coughs> I had it with me last year. <coughs> And she noticed in one of the world's most important newspapers, the Times of London, God, i got to get a glass of water. I don't know whose glass this is, so it doesn't look clean. Anyway, have an extra cup? Sounds good, sounds good. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> she uh, cut this out of a newspaper for me from the Times of London, which is, again, one of the leading newspapers in the world. Much ado with the monkeys failed the Shakespeare test. It's hard to believe that this could happen. You sure you talked about this last year? I probably did. Uh, uh, thank you. <coughs> so what happens? <coughs> the students at uh, Plymouth University convinced the National Arts Council to check out whether the monkeys could produce <coughs> Shakespeare's sonnet or anything. So. <coughs> They got four. They got two thousand sterling. It would be worth maybe four thousand or so dollars. I don't know what it'd be worth. Anyway, four or five thousand dollars. And they rented a monkey house and they bought a computer. They put the keyboard in. And Dr. Vicky Vicky Melfi, who was the uh, person in charge, said it was pretty amazing. These were really smart monkeys. They mentioned the type of monkey which is considered to be, you know, a real smart monkey. And uh, they had they hired the house for a month so that visitors couldn't disturb the monkeys. And the monkeys got the typewriter, you know, the keyboard, and then the computers outside. outside. And Dr. Melfi says the following, when they first put the keyboard in the uh, monkey house, the monkeys tried to eat it, which is not surprising, because monkeys have a brain like children. And, you know, children always put stuff in their mouth. And then they saw that it wasn't too tasty, so they stopped trying to do that. <coughs> and then they c discovered if they walked across it, it makes a click. So they started to spend a lot of time clicking away. And while they were clicking away, they also used it as a toilet. So <laughs> Dr. Velfi said it was pretty disgusting, because every day at the end she had to clean it up, keep them short-circuiting. And they typed out page after page after page outside. The printer was outside for a whole month. <coughs> six monkeys, and they did not type out a single word. Not a song, but not a single word in six months. And that's pretty surprising, because in England they speak English, and therefore the shortest word in the English language is? A. Hmm? A. Well, a, yeah, A, exactly. A is, because you don't need to make a capital, right? So I would be a problem if you have capitals. So what's the likelihood of getting an A? Well, I counted the number of the number of keys on, on my keyboard, and it's almost like a hundred. I know there's a vast number of keys on the keyboard. Know, you make mistakes all the time. Anyway, I think it came up to be a bit more than a hundred keys if I remember to do some memory, and which would mean that if you're typing out, it was 110 keys, and so it's called 100 keys. Forget that the space bar is bigger. So to get an A to be a word, it can't be like Q V Z A I W. You have to have spaces on each side, let alone the capital. You don't have to capitalize, you have to have space. So if there's 100 keyboards, what's the likelihood, like this, of hitting the space bar? <coughs> it it's the same size. I'm not going to make it that sophisticated that it's that. Instead of calling 100, 10 keys, it's called 100 keys. 10 is the same. So the likelihood would have more chance than 100. And I have to do this in sequence. So now I have to hit the space bar and get an A. So it's 100 times 100. <coughs> and space bar A space bar is 100 times 100 times 100, which comes out to be? Huh? Space bar. Two, four, six, one in a million. The likelihood of typing a one-letter word is one chance in a million if you're doing it by chance. So I did the calculation of, and I don't, and this is for many people who are getting into this, so I'm going to have to do this from memory. The only, the only sonnet I know, and even for today's only sonnet I know, is shall I compare thee to a summer's day? It's the 18th sonnet, all sonnets are the same length. Now the reason I zero in on the sonnet is because the late Stephen Hawking in his book, The Brief History of Time, says explicitly that getting all this stuff by chance 
It's kind of like the well-known hordes of monkeys hammering away on typewriters. <coughs> Very, if mostly what they write will be garbage. <coughs> these are his words. But it's an adage. Everybody knows it. But very occasionally, they will type out one of Shakespeare's sonnets. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a common, it's a common uh, adage that people say. So I wanted to see what the likelihood was of getting it. So I counted up the number of words in sonnet number 18, which is the only one I know. They're all the same line, right? First line. And it comes out to be that there were, I wish I'd written this down, but if I remember correctly, there were 488 letters in the sonnet. I didn't count spaces, which would make it harder, but the, like the Torahs were soup, so we would let that be. So the number of possible combinations, if I, if I have 488 bags, each with a do in English with, with 26 letters, so the number of possible combinations is something like 26 to the 488. But we usually don't use that as a base. We usually use 10 base or E. But in base 10, the way you switch exponents when you change base is you have to figure to what power of 10, what power of base 10 to get 26. And then you multiply that, that number, so it comes out to be 690. Take this, the likelihood of getting a Shakespeare sonnet, like or this shape, they're all the same rate, so it doesn't really make much difference. What you, should I compare these to a summer's day for getting punctuation, for getting spaces? Is <coughs> one chance in 10 to the 6 or 9th. Now, statistics never says never. Your probability never says never. You might get on the first charge. I, I used to go to against the lock of the gamble, but I used to say, I'm willing to gamble. Yes, I don't want to do this because it wouldn't be fair, but you'd have to take part in it. I'm willing to gamble. My our thank God we're home. Couldn't afford to buy today, but you know the old days were good. It was cheaper. Four bathrooms, catamaran, <coughs> an apartment to rent out besides for one dollar. The gamble's a dollar. If you can type a Shakespeare out one dollar against you doing a Shakespeare sonnet, well, no one's going to take it. We can just throw the dollar away. <coughs> you know you couldn't do it. That would be the gamble I would take. One, you lose a dollar, or I lose the apartment. And since you can't gamble, it's not forbidden. But in any event, you're not going to get it. But could you get, could you get, you know, there's no reason to it. Could you get a, uh, could you get a shonet? So I wanted to see the likelihood, not of a Shakespeare, not of, of the monkeys, but the whole universe. So the mass of the universe, our best understanding of the mass, mass of the universe today, including energy, is about 10 to the 56 grams. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a lot. Well, I'm going to call it a hundred times bigger. It can't be this large, grams per universe, because there's not enough energy in the Big Bang creation to uh, to keep the universe expanding if there's that much mass energy, because the gravity would just pull it back down. And then I'm going to say that, I, I'm, and I'm not a computer bucky, but I, I would guess for chips you could get maybe, I would say certainly uh, a million a million computer chips. Per gram, each gram that each each uh, a million computers per gram, and it's just a chip that I need. So that means each would weigh a, mil a millionth of a gram. It wouldn't be a milligram, it'd be a microgram. And then I have 480 letters, so I can say, let's say I can go through a million trials a second, because after a while you get a heat lamp. And those that are in in, in in computers, it's all words to me. I'm not, but you have, actions actually have electrons moving and eventually the energy gets too hot, so you get a heat barrier. So I'm going to say that I can get a million trials <coughs> per gram per second. Okay, so that's how, if I convert the entire universe <coughs> into computers, and I'm going to get 10 to the 6 computers per gram, and then I'm going to have a million trials per second per computer, because that means a mi 488 million operations per second in each computer. In the universe, since the beginning of time, the universe got 10 to 18 seconds old. So to find out how many trials I can do, I have 10 to the 58 times <coughs> 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 6. I'm sure I don't remember then how it's going to come out times 10 to the 18. That's the number of trials I can make from the beginning. Will I even get close to the number of the probability when you multiply experts used to add them? 56, 58, 64, 70, 88, 10 to the 88.
That's the code of 10 to the 90th. Or by a factor of 10 to the 600. You'll never get a, you'll never get a sonic. They don't even come close to being similar. So that's the argument, and yet, and yet one of the world's leading literary journals, the New Yorker, published the monkeys getting the sonic. And they didn't do it on a casual issue. It's their New, their New Year's Christ, Christmas issue. Now, this monkey's really upset. This guy's on Prozac. But I don't know. This one got it. It's got the sonnet. So you see it, and you say, well, for sure we can get a sonnet. Look, the monkey's got it, and the New Yorker said so. You'll never get a sonnet by chance. And what's strange is, and I can't imagine that, 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 uh, that, that Stephen Hawking in his brief actually put this in. Oh, here is in the very bottom. We'll read the calculation is speaking now. I, my guess is that maybe an editor to jazz up the text put it in. Because the late Stephen Hawking could figure out on the back of an envelope this calculation which I just did and realize you will never get a Shakespeare sonnet by hordes of monkeys <coughs> hammering away, let alone hordes of computers. It just won't happen. So, so how do we how do we get the Shakespeare sonnet? Well, it took intelligence, people like Paul Shakespeare to do it. So uh, anyway, that's uh, so there we see about Shakespeare's sonnet. Now, now, now what? Now uh, let's see what I know. We can deal with certain with Shakespeare's sonnet. The uh, uh, you know, there is something interesting, which is totally not that topic right there. But if you think about, if we, if we look at, 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 the, at the universe, let's see. If we look, if we look at the universe, I know you guys were here last year, so you've seen some of this stuff, but we can, we can go through it. Just, you know, quickly, I'm just trying to see if there was an example. An example of, 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 the hubris, the bizarre nature of chance in this world. You know, this is a technology review. This is, this is an online <laughs> journal from MIT. <clears throat> and it shows a creator here, like Michelangelo, the figure. And these are all mistakes. And it's like the product of a grand designer. Many persons will say, well, they can't be a god because there seem to be mistakes. As things happen, there are mistakes. And God acknowledges the mistakes. What would be the classic mistake that uh, that we have? And I'll call it a mistake. What would be the classic mistake? In the Bible, what's the classic example of a mistake? What I'm looking for, what I'm looking for. Any idea? The marble. Huh? The marble. Yeah, the flood. The flood. The flood is a classic example of a mess up. Of a mess up. I, I know I have the, 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 uh, the diagram here, but since I don't can't find it quickly, the uh, the Mabul, the flood, is an example that if you see the if and, and I ha, I've actually plotted out as, as my son did, Joshi, he's now an orthopedic surgeon. If you if you plot out the the ages of people, I never never ever get hung up. Was there a flood or wasn't? It's immaterial. It's in the text to teach. Okay, so never get pushed in the corner. Well, was there a flood? First of all, was there or wasn't a flood? Again, this, this woman making kids points out something very interestingly. That from that before the flood, the venue, the location of the flood, God says, I'm going to wipe out all life on the face of the Adama, Pnei Adama. But for the, and now the face of the Adama, that can be the whole kit and caboodle, the whole earth, or it could be whatever it is. But for the entire flood account, it's God wipes out life on the Penea Arts. Now, there's, if the Bible is really divine, well, I'll take that stand. I'll, I don't have any problem. Maybe some of you have. There's no question that the change wasn't by chance. It was by chance. It changes from the face of the Adama to the face of the Arts. But we know from the famine time, which is much later, but still from the famine, where's the famine? People come from the entire face of the Arts. Not from the whole world. So now we know, according to the text itself, regardless of Chazal, that in fact the flood is local. Okay? How local, I'm not going to get into, but it is interesting. It might be a local flood. And there are th that whole area, Mesopotamia, which means between the rivers, is a floodplain. I mean, it's always being flooded. And it, 
it's off by a few thousand years, so it's probably not, not it, but when the Bosphorus, the Bosphorus, where Constantinople is, it used to block the Mediterranean from going uh -huh. into the Dead Sea. And then there was an earthquake or something and it broke open. And the water just flowed like an avalanche in there. So it's not the exact example of the flood, literally, but that might be the historical memory of the flood. We know the Bible uses metaphor, and we also probably pretty sure that there was a flood because, or something happened because the Babylonian account of the flood is essentially identical to the biblical account, except they have it with the gods fighting, and the Bible doesn't have it with the gods fighting. They have a person that's going to be a saved, because some of the gods like him and some don't like him. He's told to build an ark. He builds an ark. The flood comes. He sends out a raven and he sends out a dove. It's exactly the same. The only difference is, on their count, the gods are fighting over him and they're going to battle over him and, you know, and, and his sacrifices, etc. So it's, theologically, it's different, but functionally, it's the same. You know, so what happens with the flood? I have no, I have no idea. But the flood is is present to tell you how God runs the world, and how God runs the world is a an example, in fact, that the might be mistakes, and I'd like to show just the plotting, but if you look at the plot of ages of people, you just you see what we all know, is that from before the flood, <coughs> people are living to 900 years, let's not get hung up on that one way or the other, and that didn't seem to work out so well, so the flood comes and the lifespans drop gradually over the next 10 generations to 100, 110, 120. So much so that Abraham, 10 generations later, it's a miracle for him, he at 89, and Sarah at 99 to conceive a child. Okay, because they would be too old. Before the flood, they'd be too young. Because puberty wasn't from average on 130. So things change. So the question is, what's going on here? Why did God have to bring on the flood? So I think that is the example that the biblical God, unlike the bar mitzvah God, does not keep control one-on-one -on -one because God, right before the flood, it's worth reading it two or five or ten times, right before you go to bed, God says, chapter 6, verse 7, right before the flood, Nechamti. Nechamti. Now, Nechamti is usually, oh, here it is, right here. Nechamti, this is ages beforehand, this is death ages, birthing ages, they both drop by a factor of ten, birthing and death then the flood, and then gradually over the next ten generations, from 900 down to 100, so that's Abraham, the last of the black. This is Adam, this is Noah, this is Abraham. Okay. So, 900 year old people were a bad idea. I mean, a really bad idea. What does God say? Nechamti. That's the text. It's not a parathetical statement, it's explicitly. It's not like, and God felt sadness, that happens a few sentences earlier. But right before the flood, that's Nechamti. So the English translations and the kosher Hebrew translations are, I regret, <coughs> repent, or reconsider. Now, I didn't learn that from my bar mitzvah, and I guarantee you, you didn't learn it either. But that's a problem with keeping bar mitzvah in mind when you get back to college. Changes do occur, and God says, Nechamti, and brings on the flood. And the more dramatic <coughs> example, which is the time that the flood was a flood or not, we don't know. But one thing we do know, that the first king of Israel was, was Shaul. Who chooses Saul to be king? Who chooses Saul to be king? God. God, you'd keep up, kid, right? God chooses Saul to be king. Who anoints Saul? Shmuel. Saul's a great warrior, a phenomenally powerful warrior. But he messes up. And what happens? God says the identical word is before the flood. Same verb, same form, nechamti. I regret having chosen for king. There's no debate about that. That's the meaning. I mean, you can't get away from that because the kingship is taken away. So the biblical God has regret. Now, what nechamti means on divine terms, I don't know. But guess what? We don't live in divine terms. We live in human terms. So to try to say, well, in divine terms, it might be different. That's sweet to say, but we have no idea because we don't know divine terms. We know human terms. And Nahamti, if you hear God saying Nahamti, my suggestion is duck. Because good news, it's not. Okay, so, uh, 
So the biblical God is a little bit different from the Bar Mitzvah God, and you have to realize that when you're having arguments, because the people that have a superficial knowledge of the Bible would tell you, well, if God's running the show, why are there errors? Why do people get cancer? Why was there a holocaust? Well, God did let Cain murder Abel, and that would be a local holocaust at the time. Could God have stopped Cain from murdering Abel? You betcha. How do we know that? Because when God says to Cain, Cain, get out of here, Cain gets out. He follows the exile. So God could have stopped. So why didn't God do it? Why didn't, stop, why didn't God stop the Holocaust? Okay? I mean, in other words, these things happen, but it doesn't show that there's no God active in the world because there are situations where you see in the text itself. You can't tell it in the few sentences of Genesis chapter 1. As I say, you get 26 sentences from the creation of the universe to Adam, and there's no information given. So how God runs the world, you have to really look at the rest of the text text, which is kind of like a, a commentary. <coughs> That's how I see a commentary. So what are, so the problem, so you're not going to get monkeys. Uh, you're not going to get Shakespeare's sonnet. Are the mutations random? There are no data, there are no data that prove that the mutations are random. I always tell all, all the students that I have that are going on into, into college, you would never, ever make do the foolishness of confronting your, your biology instructor or your anthropology instructor to say, show me that the mutations are random. Because you probably would not get your degree then. Okay, I say it seriously, just watch the movie Expelled and you'll see what's happened to people that are trying to use, to use that argument. Wait till you get your degree, and then in the coffee, you know, at the end, when you just have a little, they look like outside here at the end of the, after you got your degree, every celebrate, you say, gee, but, uh, you know, I, I never, show me that they're random. There are no data that support that the mutations are in. The life developed from the simple to the complex. I hope it's right or the Bible's wrong. I mean, life starts on the, in, animal life starts in the waters, moves to the land, up, 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 and finally becomes people. So it's not that, that the development of life is just fun. The problem is the word evolution. Watch out for the word evolution, because intrinsic, built into the word evolution, now exists the word random. And if I had the slides, I would show you, but from journal after journal, the description, and also, in the, I've had them in, in, in sessions, uh, persons who have mixed their life in studying the, the, paleont the, ret the fossil record, okay, the development of life. And I asked them, how does evolution work? And all of them, all is a total of four, because I've only met four professionals at age so far, over the, over the years. And all four say exactly the same. Evolution is a two-stage process. Random mutations in the sex line make variations in the progeny and the offspring, and then some baby lions are born strong and some baby lions are born weak. And clearly the strong ones eat the weak ones. The reason that there are not a lot of lions has nothing to do with hunters. Lions kill and eat other lions. That's what they do. They even know genes. They know genetics. When the, al when the new lion comes in and becomes the alpha lion, and he it either kills or drives away the previous alpha lion, all the cubs that are, it's a phenomenal, I only know this in literature, I've never studied it. All the cubs that are born in the next, I think it's about four months, the new alpha lion kills. <coughs> the mother tries to protect them, but she's no match for the alpha lion. Why does he kill the new cubs? It's as if they know that it's not their genes. I mean, they know it's not, it's not their genes. It's a phenomenal. It's, it's, when you think about that, the level of, of, of animal intelligence in the world is extraordinary. You know, why would he want to kill them off? More cubs means he's got a bigger, he's got a bigger tribe to be boss over. But that doesn't interest him. He wants those new tribes to be his genes. And he, and he kills, and he kills them. And the Ema tries to fight him, but she's no, she's no, she's no match for the, for the big alpha line. Anyway, what was he getting at? Oh, so mutations are not a problem. There's a whole section in Leviticus, right? You could right? About the mutations of Levi'im that can't serve in the temple because they're, they're uh, mutated, and they list the mutations. It doesn't mean that they're any less of a human, but like the offerings have to be perfect, so the offerer has to be perfect. These imperfect living can still eat the, can still eat the, uh, the, the sacrifice. So sa sacrifice is not like that God is saying you're an inferior being. It's just that you know, I want perfect offerings with perfect, with perfect offerers. So, so the Torah is aware that mutations occur, so the idea of mutations being a source for the development of life 
is not a problem. The problem with mutations is there are so many wrong mutations. There's an excellent book called Life's Solutions. The man says, right off the bat, he's an agnostic. He doesn't know yes or no about God, and his name has to be Conway, War Conway Morris, who's the most important <coughs> living paleontologist today. And it's published by the Oxford University Press, which means it's a real publication. And he says right at the front, evolution is true. But he sees no way, having spent his life studying the fossil record, that random evolution could have chosen the right, that's the key, is it random or not? And randomness doesn't seem to work if you put the numbers in. Of course, the argument of the, of the professor will say, well, you know, you, it's, it's, maybe your model is wrong. Ah, but the argument that it's random, watch out for this, because it, it just doesn't hold up. And it's sufficiently embarrassing that I can almost guarantee you, if you put the professor in that corner, you probably would not get your degree. You'd probably be told this is not the department to do it. Because that, sir, we have that documented on the movie, on the movie Expelled. So that's not a question that it does, has happened. Would happen to other, no. So randomness is, is, is the, uh, is the problem of mutation is just fine. The word randomness is the problem that, that we have. Uh, and the, well, the fossil record that was listed up here, there's a fossil, the fossil record shows a gradual flow from the simple to the complex. It does. Every dot isn't filled in. But it does show a flow from the simple to the complex, and the, I think the most the most basic is that every one of us have the identical alphabet in our cells that those trees out the window have, that that uh, that an elephant has, that every piece of life on Earth, whether it's plant or vegetable, has the identical alphabet to spell out its words, and the identical DNA, in other words, absolutely identical. Same. Thing. Only difference is that the that the letters in that DNA spell out something different. I mean, you have English with 26 <coughs> letters, a Hebrew with 22. You can write all those books on a shelf, and then you can have another shelf with, with all physics books. You have another shelf with Shakespeare's books. You have another shelf with with music with um, words for music, and they're all using the same alphabet because that's the beauty of the alphabet, and that's the beauty of the DNA. That the DNA, that our genetic code can, in fact, be used across the board for everything. But it does show that there was a common ancestor, and that means that this is pre-programmed. Pre-programmed, I mean by pre-programmed, that the system was set up with a, with a system, an, an alphabetical system called the genetic code, that could spell all kinds of life right from the beginning. Because it's amazing. And, and the phenomena of the DNA, of, the, of our genetic code, is such that if you took all the books in the world, and all the music in the world, and coded them on the genetic code, it's not my calculation, <coughs> you fit all of them on the head of a pin, not the point of the pin, on the head of, on the head of a pin at that level, because the DNA is so complex, so compacted, so compacted that it can turn light beams essentially into people, because the Big Bang, the Big Bang produced light beams. If you took all the DNA out of any one of your bodies, Okay, so in each cell there are approximately two meters of this double helix if you open it up, two meters long. And you have how many, about 70, what's the number, 70, I've got the number. In any case, in an average sized person, if you took out all the, all the cells and you just tie the DNA together, one to the other to the other to show how much information is in your body, that DNA would stretch from the earth to the sun and back to the earth 500 times. 500 round trips is what in our body, and it's all compacted in this little space. It show, shows the level of compaction and sophistication of development. So, it, you know, it's, it's not fair to say, well, it couldn't get that by, by randomness, because that doesn't, that doesn't convince anyone. But the idea of looking at randomness to produce these, these complexity, that doesn't work when you look at numbers. Does it prove there's a God? I don't think so. But it certainly proves that we don't understand on evolution. That was my little letter in the uh, New York Times. Because how that happened? Well, that happened was a few about now, of course, probably ten years ago. There was a famous atheist. In fact, he was the most famous atheist living. His name was Anthony Flew. He, he was. He makes these famous scientists like small potatoes can't do numbers. He wasn't the same. He was a philosopher. And he proved philosophically that you could that there could not be a God. 
he did this in 1950, the early 1950s. And what was extraordinary about his proof, it was so perfect and powerful that it became the largest, the most widely quoted paper in any field of philosophy for 50 years. You realize as a scientist, when you publish a paper and no one cites it, it's meaningless. It's only if it's cited by other people to use your information for the next step that it's significant. His paper that proved there could not be a god was the most widely quoted paper in all fields of philosophy for 50 years. And then he read a, a book by, by Roy Varghese, a magnificent human being who's in Dallas, Texas. He's, he's an Asian Indian high tech in the state. And Roy, Roy Varghese <coughs> took me from Israel, and this man Anthony flew from England and took us together at NYU as a very good uh, film studio. And we produced, he produced, he did it all in his own pocket, a book called A Science Discovered God. Anthony Flew made the mistake of reading my book. Um, I think the first of this, I don't know which one, I, one of my, one of, I don't recall which one it was, and he read Roy Varghese's book. He relates it to me, he flew relates it to me, and he changed. I was very, when we met, he had already changed. So I'm very pleased because it would be very embarrassing to see a person. By then he was in his 70s. He died about, about six years ago. Uh, and he, and I would rather not, you know, I'm not interested in making life difficult for people. But he read this and he changed. And the whole discussion, which is a film called Has Science Discovered God, uh, was his discussion. And he, and he said, I go, to, I, I go to where Socrates, I go to, he quotes Socrates, I go to where truth leads me. And he said, this, in fact, he published a book, like, book after we had this meeting called There Is No God, and then Noah's crossed out and it says there is a God. So it's kind of interesting. But that book made people so angry that the New York Times, <coughs> you know, the New York Times Magazine section, if you realize on the Sunday edition, is the Sunday edition worldwide. And they quote, they have this, they mention this on the cover, in the article, which is about ten pages, some about five or ten pages, they quote me nine times. Partly as a person that duped Lou, uh, fact that he flew F L E W. If you want to look him up, I tricked him to that. I didn't trick anyone. No, I flew was completely cognizant. He just saw that you can't get this stuff by randomness. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. If you enter the system without the presumption that it's random, you see that it can't be random. It's the same, it's actually no this this idea of paradigm and pre-understanding. Everyone, if you read the Rashi and you extract from your work, your head beginning, in the beginning, you say you don't know it. And you read the Rashi, you realize the text never said in the beginning, by a beginning, from a beginning, or with a beginning. Beginning <coughs> is nowhere in Genesis chapter one, verse one. Nowhere. Just read the Rashi without beginning in your head. And you realize all these translations are wrong. They come from the Septuagint, which forced a lot of garbage on us. But that was just one of them. <coughs> but we read the Rashi with such an understanding that it must mean beginning, that we somehow read into him beginning. But he says point blank, if it wasn't, the, the word people would have shown up. That break sheet. And to prove it, he sends us to proverb number eight. And I can't get, I, you guys, you believe it or not, it's, it's, I hope you would, but it's insignificant to my, my colleagues in, in physics, because they'll never believe that the actual translation, as the Ramban brings down from the Jerusalem, Targum Rushayim, is Bahachmatabara, with wisdom God created the heavens and the earth. That the, that the, with the first cause, wisdom, and it comes directly from Proverb number eight, which Rashi sends us to. I am wisdom. God made me as the beginning of God's ways. Wisdom is what the substrate is. The word beginning is not, the, um, the reason I'm saying this is because, uh, about hanging up, because when you enter into an argument with, with randomness, and if randomness is already your, pri, pri, uh, your, your paradigm, you will never get randomness away, because every argument you will see randomness in, even if you can't prove it. So that's a problem in, in trying to make changes. It's just, it's just very hard to change paradigms. Like the paradigm, to show that there was an origin to the universe, I mean, for 3,500 years, the Torah has been saying the universe had a beginning, a creation. God creates the heavens and the earth. But for 30, for 3,500 years, minus, minus 60 years, science said, no, the universe is eternal. The Bible is wrong from the first sentence. Because it's very, and finally it was forced down, even though there were data that implied a beginning. Finally, it was forced down the throats of science, literally forced down by the discoveries of Arnold Pentis and Robert Wilson, when they discovered the echo of the Big Bang. That changed the world overnight. 
So to change your paradigm is, <coughs> is extraordinarily difficult. So anyway, that's, those are the types of things that... So what is the, uh, the fossil record shows a development from... Uh, the shows, shows a development from... Uh, <laughs> from, the, from, the simple to, from the simple to the complex. That's not a problem. The question is what drove it. I mean, he started with life in the borders and moved in. Now, sometimes people will say, where the arguments with you know, say it's, it's three in the morning, you've had a couple of beers, and now they're going to pull out your Bible and you say, well, look at this. The sun appears on day number four, but there's plants on day number three. So how do you have that? Any of you hear that argument? We have an answer for that? I mean, I have an answer because my doctor's in two fields, one's the earth sciences. The answer is, for that, when you be arguing with it, is the change from or to me or, to me or or lot to me or Until you get to day number four, it's or Only when you get to day four, it's me or So what happens is plenty of light going on, but you can't see the me or You can't see the luminaries. You can't see the sun and the moon, the sun and the stars. But there's plenty of sunlight coming through for photosynthesis, and that I can't see as a fact because I've actually measured many times more than 10 and maybe as many as 50 <coughs> times, photosynthesis, plants bubbling out oxygen when the overcast is so heavy that you can't see the globe, often you can see a globe behind the clouds. But I'm talking about overcast where you don't see anything. <coughs> and yet there's plenty of sunlight filtering through and the plants are just pumping out oxygen. They don't need to have, they don't ha need to have, have the mi'orot seen. And only on day number four does it talk about mi'orot and on day number four, if you look at the ages of each of the days, and you, if you just get there talking about downstairs, and they, but then you go day by day, you discover that by day four, the Earth has cooled enough. The Earth is molten originally. Molten, high vapor pressure, lots of, lots of overcast. And you have life. But by day four, the Earth has cooled. And the, and, and the, and the, and the, uh, the sky has cleared, and you see the Mi'oro for the first time. And we know it's discussing it from an Earth perspective because it says the two great, the two great Mi'orot, the one for the day and the one for the light. And there's only one place in the universe where the sun and the moon look the same size. And that's from the Earth. Because the sun has a diameter that is 400 times the diameter of the moon, but the moon is 400 times closer to the Earth than the sun. So parallax makes them match exactly, which is intriguing in itself because it lets you do a lot of astronomy you couldn't do otherwise. So, uh, anyway, so, you know what, I, that's, that's generally kind of, one of the two, two things that are interesting, but here is the proof that, that, there is no, that there is no God, even though you can't get the DNA twice by chance. Because why? Because there are infinite Earths and parallel universes, and they really exist. It's not a question. They really exist. Now, this is the most widely sold science journal, probably by a factor of 10 and maybe by 100, because it's not peer-reviewed, which means it's cheap. Peer-reviewed journals are expensive because it's expensive to do the work peer-reviewed, peer and you have to send the article out, you have to get it back, you have to analyze it. They, if the editor likes the article, they publish it. Scientific American, infinite Earths and parallel universes really exist. And they talk about it in the text, but they don't want you to miss the argument, so they show it to you in four-color printing, in, in the picture. Cosmologists infer, oh dear, it just changed. He was really exist, but now they infer. Ah, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> Cosmologists infer. It's, that's embarrassing, actually, because this is the world's most widely read science journal. So you wonder why people are going to the beach on Rosh Hashanah and McDonald's or Chinese food on, on, uh, on Yom Kippur. You can't blame them. They read this stuff. And everyone reads it because it's, you can afford it. You can't afford to, you know, unless you're very well to do, you can't afford to subscribe to science or nature. They, they cost so much more, and the, the details are so intricate. Well, this takes them and slashes the information around, so it takes, it's like a little bit like Pablo. If cosmologists infer the, and I want you to listen enough to hear the, the bizarre logic. Cosmologists infer the presence of these other parallel universes by scrutinizing the properties of our universe. These properties include, and then they list the forces of nature, which are just right for life, not for forming life, but for sustaining it. These properties include the number of time dimensions, the number of spaces, the dimensions, 
were established by random processes during the birth of our universe. Yet they have exactly the values that sustain life. That suggests the existence of other universes with other values that don't sustain life. Do you hear the logic? I guess you don't. The fact that our universe is perfect is the best, strongest proof at the moment that there are other universes. String theory doesn't do that. The fact that our universe is perfect is the scientific evidence <coughs> that there are other universes with other laws that aren't perfect. And guess why we're in this universe? Because it's the perfect universe. There are a lot of losers, and one's going to win. And obviously, you have to be in the winner, because you happen to be in the loser, and you're not there anymore. The logic is that our universe is it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. Bugging. These have exactly the same values that extend to sustain life. That suggests other universes with other values. It doesn't suggest anything of the sort. Make sure. You, I mean, it's. I would hope that you could convince your other universe. Assuming you go to a universe that has some level, you know, you have to have some level of brains. I would assume that you could make you at least at that argument. You could convince even after a few beers at three o'clock in the morning that it doesn't make sense. But that's the argument. The biggest argument is that we are perfect. And the universe, right from the beginning, the universe is set up for complexity. If you think about it, if you, just from atoms, ATOMS, an atom has a center, which has protons and neutrons, and then around it, and the neutrons have no, no charge, and the protons have a quite conventional plus charge, and then around it are electrons. And the electrons have a negative charge. So if you have one proton, like for hydrogen, so you have one electron out balancing the charge. But what's interesting is a proton weighs 1,835 times heavier than an electron. But they have the same charge. Now that's bizarre. Because normally, if you, let's say, you get yourself a brand new, a brand new Alfa Romeo, and you're standing, you know, you pull up to the red light, the guy behind you bumps you. It's brand new. You just take it home to show your wife. Now, this actually happened to me, but it wasn't in my Alfa Romeo, it was in his. And I was I was real clever. And so I didn't bump him, but I passed him on railroad tracks, and he was making a left turn. Of course, I did the right thing, passing on the left. He only passed on the left. Crash. He didn't get to say, show his wife to bring. He was bringing the car home to show his wife. Okay, well, let's go back. <coughs> so you got your new Alfa Romeo. Yeah, that's exactly how I felt. He was a nice guy, he took it, he, he, said, he called the police and he said they seem like the nice guys, they don't seem that they're drunk, etc., etc. So what it did was cost me. He's, he's in the car. In any event, so you, you got your new you pull up to the front, and a car pulls him back, and stuff it like, bang, it hits you. Okay, you know what He backs up, bang, it hits you again. Backs up, hits you, well this time you get up, you're furious. And you step out of your car and you discover he's 1,835 times bigger than you. Oh, it's no problem. I'll get it fixed by myself. The likelihood of a, of a particle of mass that has 1,835 times the mass of the identical charge opposite it is slim. <coughs> but if electrons weren't almost as light as nothing, you couldn't form molecules. The unit in which then molecules form complexity, which form you. The universe from its very inception is designed for complexity, even in an atom. And from there and from there it goes even it goes even further. So any, so anyway, that's uh, it, 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 there's other, I mean there's lots of other things that are interesting, the position of the Earth in the in the solar system. Uh, there are aspects of the Big Bang. Much most of my website, most many many of these things are dealt with in, in great detail and words. In, on my website, so I know. Do you guys have my card, my website access or not? It's not, I just, you, oh, you guys all have them? Yeah, yes, no? no. So I'm just, no. A, they stick, just, I just pass it around and what's left over just, you know, just send it, send it around. And so we take, uh, take this, this, this thing around and they stick together. If you want it, don't worry. So, okay, that, so we have to end in about three or four minutes. Do you guys have questions? So, questions, yeah, now questions, yeah. Yes, question, no question. This question, this question. Well, the guy in back, if you had his hand up first. Do you believe that Adam was the first man? I think Adam was the, if you go to my website, I have a whole thing on the science of the guy, I have chapters on this. I put it this way, Adam was the first homo sapiens sapien. 
with an Ishama, okay? Uh, the Ram, the Ramban, no, in Kilayim, in Kilayim, I think it's the eighth mission. It talks. It says, "Abnei Hasidah, the master, Chayot, the masters of the field are animals." Straight statement. Now, what profession masters the field? But what would you say? It's not a trick question. What? Do you say? what? Yeah. Well, what profession? I said. Uh, Farmer, yeah, farming goes back 10,000 years. So these farmers were animals. Rabbi Yossi says you have to bury them like a dead human because you can't tell them apart. Now the commentary that they were dead gorillas is almost embarrassing on the commentator. If anyone thinks a dead gorilla looks like a person, my suggestion is new glasses or new Vishnu. Okay? There were beings that existed that were <coughs> farmers. It's interesting, the glyph in Chinese for man is a field crossed with a man above it. It's also the symbol for men's room, which is useful because I worked a lot in China. And knowing the symbol of men's room is very, very useful. Although you can smell it also because they save the urine. The, the wet goes to pour it in the fields because it's so much nitrogen. So if you do, you can smell your wet smell. But you can there. So not not that integrating it, I'm just saying. That's <coughs> so there were beings at some time that were animals. It's a straight statement. It wasn't were they or weren't they. But they were not humans. And yet they had the ability to develop farming and look just like dead humans. That's not Neanderthal. Neanderthal doesn't look like dead humans. It looks like a dead Neanderthal. High forehead, etc. And I'm just saying, to you, but the other source that's much more important, or the Rambam, the Rambam in the morning of Uhim. I think it's part one, chapter seven, talks about beings that were completely human, Adam had sex with them. In the 130 years where Adam and Eve split, you realize, you know, chapter 4 and chapter 5, it's 130 years we became able to say. And Adam had sex, and the doc says that they were banim mamash, actual children, but they weren't humans, the kids from this, un this union. They, had, they were, they were, uh, they were, but it's, it, I, I, I'm afraid to do it from my books, of, in any event, here's what I say. When the Science Museum, when the British Mu the Science Museum, when the anthropology textbook, and when your teacher says that people go back 90,000 to 100,000 years, that people invented farming 50,000 years ago, that people buried their dead for the last 15, 20,000 years with food, buried their dead with food and trinkets, the, the anthropology teacher, the textbook teacher, and the whatever museum are correct by their definition of a person. And the founder of Asia Torah, I, no, I'm just, I teach it Asia, Noah Weinberg, this brilliant human being said, in any discussion, the first thing you have to do is define your terms. The museum defines a person as a being that looks like you and looks like me, and it's your brains and my brains. They go back 90,000 years ago to cross the river. Adam had a change, uh, there's a whole section we didn't get into it today, there's a, well, we did it for a second up there. The Neshama changed the world. But, so the, so bees that look like you, look like me, your brains go back time, and they're correct. The Bible defines a person as a being that looks like you, looks like me, has your brains and my brains, and has a Neshama. And they go back less than 6,000 years. And the museums date it. That's what's so, I tell you, it sounds corny, but maybe I said it in the lecture, I've said it before. I almost fell on my knees and, and wept when I saw the number on the board, <laughs> on the wall. The British Museum, 100% secular, dates the change in society. Let that sink in. Let your ears hear what your mouth is black. The British Museum dates a change in civilization. Not in physiology, in civilization. They give a date. And the date matches in the Shama which the Bible claims, thousands of years ago, changed the world. The Neshama changed the world. And science demonstrates it. The proof shall string from the earth. Psalm 84. It's just amazing. I, I just find that phenomenal, that they're willing to put a date. They don't mention God. Bible is not in the, on the plaque. You know what's describing it? No, no Neshama, no, no nothing is biblical. Just the change, writing. Trading, but the marker is large cities. That's the marker, because before the Neshama, you couldn't have a large city. And I asked the I asked the curator, was it a population explosion? 
And he said, no, that's, that's the conundrum, that's the puzzle. Population explosion goes back to farming. Because then now you have big families. When you're hunting together, you can't have a big family. So the population explosion goes back to farming 10,000 years ago, 9,000 years, give it a couple of thousand years, 8,000 years, 7,000 years ago, even 6,000, no, 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 about 5,500 years ago, just a couple of years, right after the summer comes in, spreads, and bingo, you've got large cities. I mean, how much evidence do you need in the end? It goes time and again, point after point of the Bible, that goes out on a limb, comes out to be verified. So, uh, uh, if, so if you end up going to a British university, my suggestion is when you have the argument, you know, you know, spring the extra thirty dollar whatever it costs to get it, and take your friend to the British Museum and point out the date. And uh, uh, yes. What's your view on climate change? What's your view on climate change? Climate change has. Look, it's, it's, it's a child, climate related change. Look, I, it's totally what I read in the, in the literature, so I don't have any inside knowledge on this, but we do know that the Earth goes through cycles. That's for certain. There was a time when it was called the snowball Earth, when it froze over, and then it, it broke free by volcanic actions and starting to melt it. So that the, that the climate changes, whether we are doing it or not, is the argument. That's the problem. Whether it, First of all, if you were concerned about climate change as a personal level, because you have to really work on each person can contribute, the first thing that you would do would become a vegetarian. The, the floats from cattle, because of the nature of how they dis digest their, their food, produces more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than all the cars in the United States. So if you are concerned about climate change, become a vegetarian. Okay, that's what I would say. Because if it is the carbon, if it is CO2, it's because you're eating meat. You know, that's your state. Yeah. What do you think about the notion of that, specifically about the notion of Sina? Because they're not really in any text, and you just have to go on the fact that they were passed out from the other topics. So interesting, because I, I, I'm in contact with the man by the name Mahoney. You can get a hold of his book. His work is exquisite. He, uh, he quotes all the people that say no. Oh, he's a Christian, a man who's determined. He's determined that it had to happen because his whole Christian faith is based on the Exodus. You know, people don't realize that, so they're very. So he's very concerned, and he spent a, must have been a fortune. Now he has lots of sponsors. You get his movies. His name is Tim Mahoney. One was Patterns of Evidence. That's the first one that's out. The second one I just saw, literally the second and last night. It's not a it's a, it's a privileged view because it's coming out in March to show exactly. What's so nice. What's your name? Yoni. Huh? Yoni. Yoni. It's exactly the argument that he's working on now, and it's, it's so interesting. Is was there an alphabet available for Moses to write it down? See, that's an argument. Now, because hieroglyphics go back, interestingly, to the time of Adam. But you can't write the text that Moses got in hieroglyphics. You have to have an alphabet for that. An alphabetic writing is supposed to, because the glyphs were whole words. And so you can't, be, you know, you can't write it explicitly. So you need an alphabet. And it looks like, now it looks like the data are that proto-Kaniac, which, which blends, which evolves into Hebrew. Remember the Hebrew language, the script, Ezra changes. So we, as it changes the script, right? I mean, so so we know there are changes going on in time. Going, the words don't change, but the way that it's written. So there is a. Uh, and it turns out there is an alphabet that becomes available. The, the question is, did Moses have it? It would be pretty obvious if an alphabet exists, Moses would have it, uh, because Moses was raised in the in the richest house in the world at the time. Pharaoh. Or alternatively, and the question comes up at the end of the film that is not the one that hasn't been released, it will be released in March. Was it a divine? That's the question he asked. Was it was it conceived of, or was it divine inspiration? Because it happened suddenly, the appearance of the language, not the appearance of writing. Writing we see writing which is hieroglyphic, where a, where a symbol is a word, like the glyph 